cities swept into the sea, civilizations lost beneath the waves. But is Atlantis more than a myth? Are there real sunken cities waiting to be discovered? Today, marine archaeology and new sea mapping technology are uncovering ancient sunken cities around the world. And every year, our seas rise, claiming more land, bit by bit. Do these lost worlds provide a frightening glimpse into our own ecological future? What stories will our great-great-grandchildren tell? What cities will be lost? Sea level rises all the time on our planet. We are one major storm from being below sea level again. Throughout history, we've told stories of floods. Perhaps the most famous is the biblical flood account of Noah, a flood story that's shared by Babylonian, Greek, and indigenous cultures around the world. They all tell a familiar story. Gods, angered by the sins of mankind, send a cleansing deluge to scour the earth. Almost as famous is the story of Atlantis, a great city-state washed away in a single day. The information on the center city of Atlantis comes from Plato. It was a roughly circular city. It had three canals, equal distance from each other. The three canals then had interspersed between them bands of land where there were temples and other building structures. But sunken cities are not just fantasy. From the earliest days of deep water exploration, researchers have encountered mysterious underwater structures. David Sear investigates the waters off the coast of England. It may come as a surprise to many people that um, there are actually quite a few lost cities um, under the sea, but they're there for very different reasons. I mean, Dunwich is there for coastal erosion purposes, um, collapsing down cliffs. But we know of Port Royal, for example, in the Caribbean, that. Uh, went in one event, one earthquake event. Uh, we know of the cities that lie off the Egyptian coast, uh, in Alexandria, for, uh, for example. Um, and then there is the hint that, with rising sea level over the last um, 8,000 years, that there are probably other settlements that lie off the coast. Certainly off the east coast of uh, the UK, uh, we know of other villages which had churches um, and manors that uh, have gone into the sea as well. There's at least 12 known along this coast alone. As technology progressed, scientists even came up with a plausible explanation for Noah's flood. Robin Bell is a research scientist at Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. During the last ice age, the Black Sea dried up primarily. And so think of this beautiful flat valley and a really nice place to live. And then what happened is the, the ice sheets that covered Canada and covered Scandinavia melted. Sea level rose and rose and rose and suddenly it breached this dam that's sort of at the edge of, it's called the Bosporus in Turkey. And so the water rose and you suddenly flooded it. So sea level was moving inland about a kilometer a day. But it was the remote tropical island of Bimini that brought sunken cities to the public eye in the 1960s. Researchers were tackling the biggest prize of them all, the lost city of Atlantis. Their clues were the words of Plato himself and a bizarre prediction made decades earlier. In the 1930s, the American prophet Edgar Cayce declared Atlantis would be discovered off the coast of Bimini in the Bahamas. Well, Edgar Cayce was called the sleeping prophet by the New York Times back in, I believe, 1918. Uh, Cayce was born in 1877, died in 1945, and he's considered the most famous prophet, uh, the most famous psychic that America's ever had. He gave over 14,000 psychic readings, and about one-third of all of Casey's readings involved the ancient world or ancient mysteries, ancient history. He said a portion of Atlantis would rise again in 1968 and 1969, and he implicated Vimini in the Bahamas. Edgar Casey's prediction really is weird. 
here's this man. Nobody expected this. And out of nowhere, there he is, laying on a couch in Virginia Beach. And he says, Poseidia will rise again. A portion of Poseidia will rise again. Expect it in 68 and 69. Not so far away. That's bizarre. It's a prediction that seemed to just come out of nowhere. Nobody said, Edgar, when is Atlantis going to rise again? When is a portion of Atlantis going to rise again? Then, in 1968, a controversial discovery was made near Bimini, about a mile offshore in 20 feet of water. A 1,600-foot-long formation of stone blocks was found lying on the bottom. Because the formation resembled a stone causeway, it became known as the Bimini Road. You can see the Bimini Road from the air, but it has to be a day when there's not a lot of wind. It has to be a day when the water's really clear. Scientists had known for years that the oceans of the world have risen and fallen dramatically through the ages. Sea level rises all the time on our planet, and that's part of that cycle on our planet. It's, it gets warmer, it gets colder, we take water out of the ocean, we dump the ice back in, and the sea level goes up and down. In fact, what is now three fathoms deep off Bimini was dry land 6,000 years ago. Around 4,000 BC, the water was around 10 to 12 feet lower, which is when we believe the Bimini Road was probably being used as a breakwater. Today, Greg and his wife Laura are continuing their five year investigation of Bimini Road. They're out to change the minds of skeptical scientists who say the underwater structure is nothing but a natural rock formation. They're searching for stone anchors, multi-layered rocks, any shred of proof the formation is man-made. My wife and I got involved in investigating the Bimini Road basically because of a formation that was on Andros Island that was first found in 1969. Yeah, we started our research in Andros, and we're really expanding beyond that. Uh, we ended up realizing we needed to go check out Bimini and the Bimini Road. I actually do believe that historically there was something called Atlantis that probably stimulated Plato's stories of Atlantis. Plato did write some history. They weren't all fiction. So I believe there was something that started this story of Atlantis. But according to the history books, Nobody lived on Bimini back then. It's a major problem to mainstream science. They cannot acknowledge that there was an unknown maritime culture here in 3000 BC. From what I know about mainstream archaeology, this is probably the most controversial site on the face of the earth. The people seem to sit on one side or the other. It's natural or it's not natural. An underwater structure built by an unknown civilization in the Caribbean 6,000 years ago? Sounds far-fetched, but Greg Little says seeing is believing. formation it's very impressive but like I said you really can't tell what it is till you get right down to it and get under the stones all right we're going uh, straight under the boat we're gonna go to the north we're in right in the middle of the of the J uh, it is an area that looks sort of irregular but it's probably the area where there's the most double triple blocks and blocks under blocks What you really see there, and what most impresses you, is you do see a lot of square and rectangular blocks, massive blocks. Some of them are 20 feet long, 15, 20 feet wide, and they're generally one to two and a half feet thick. And it looks like they're laying on the bottom, and it looks like it's an arranged pattern.
Today, Greg is looking for evidence of layered stones, evidence that would suggest ancient hands placed the stones one on top of another. Do I believe that this is Atlantis rising? I don't know. Expedition leader Bill Keith has spent years guiding adventurers at Bimini Road and diving it himself. In order to believe that this is Atlantis, you have to believe in Atlantis in the first place. Uh, do I believe that this area has aspects to it that appear as if there's design? Yeah, I do. There's a little too much symmetry. There's a little too many squared off areas, a little too much spacing in these stones for it all to be just natural. It's difficult to make out now because of the sun, but there's two, there's two parallel rows of stones right here. The two parallel rows are made up of rectangular stones. And this area right in here is where you can see the most obvious evidence that this very well may have some design to it as opposed to being just a natural formation. Frankly, as far as what they're made, a lot of what the stones are made of is beach rock. So if you're looking for a quick dismissal of the whole theory, you can jump on that if you want. What they fail to say is that every square inch of the bottom from the drop off to shore was the shoreline. So if their theory is true, why is it that these two parallel rows of stones only appear here? Why They should appear sporadically all the way into shore, and they don't. They also don't run the entire length of the island, so there's a north and south border. So there's no explanation for that. Keith says the so-called road to Atlantis is just one of the many mysteries on Bimini. Well, in addition to the Atlantis road, the Bimini stones, there, there's quite a few metaphysically oriented uh, aspects to Bimini. Uh, one of the most well-known are the Shark Mountain. Uh, when you have an opportunity to fly over the northeastern part of the island and you look down, you're going to notice that there are uh, a series of sand dunes that appear to look like a fish, a shark, uh, one is a seahorse, one is a cat. And at first, your eye may not pick it up, but when someone points it out to you, it really does resemble those things. And what's unique about that is the fact that these images appear on maps drawn by Bahamians before any Bahamians had the ability to fly or see them from the air. And that's really the mystery. How did they know they were there? And also there's the legend of the Fountain of Youth. Uh, that, that's an area located over on South Bimini. Uh, it's been pretty well documented in history that when Ponce de Leon was looking for the Fountain of Youth, he was following directions uh, that were written by Indians, and they were directing him to a place that was spelled B-E-E-M-E-E-N-E-E. -E -E -E. Now, there's no physical evidence to show that he ever actually got here. However, that also ties Bimini into the whole legend and lore of the Fountain of Youth. So there's, there's quite a few metaphysically oriented uh, attractions to the island other than the Atlantis Road, with the Atlantis Road being the, the biggest of them by far. The crew returns to the surface. Whatever the mysteries of Bimini are, they are yet to be revealed. I think if if mainstream science recognized that the Bim, that what we call the Bimini Road is actually some sort of a breakwater from an unknown maritime culture, I think underwater archaeologists would start looking a little more in the Bahamas. There were some cultures here, there were some unknown people here, and they traveled a lot. This is actually a pretty large breakwater, so it implies that the ships were fairly large. They weren't little tiny canoes. One thing Bimini skeptics and true believers can agree on. The waters here have risen dramatically, and they may not be done. Another devastating flood is not so far-fetched. The problem there is, is that you have hurricanes that throw through walls of water every year, and they just sweep islands clean. These walls of water literally go over the entire islands and just sweep them clean. So, of course, you're not going to find structures on the surface. On two prior occasions, hurricanes in 1927 and again in 1932 that came at the island from the west actually put the entire island underwater briefly. We are one major storm from, you know, being below sea level again, at least for, for a short period of time. And Bimini is not the only source of controversy. 
Around the world, sunken structures have researchers at odds. Is it natural or is it a sunken city? Here off the coast of Yonaguni Island, this is Japan's Atlantis. Stone formations, including pyramid-like structures, dot the submarine landscape. Some researchers believe they are sunken ruins stretching hundreds of miles. But just like in Bimini, others disagree, saying these are just naturally occurring formations molded by the currents and tides over many years. The problem is, no one really knows what a 6,000-year-old sunken city would look like. Is it a civilization or a natural formation? The debate continues in Bimini and Japan. But some evidence is indisputable. In northwestern France, ancient civilizations left their mark all across this region, known as Brittany. Here, megaliths, also known as meniers, dot the landscape. Enormous stones set upright, preserved for thousands of years. Ancient burial grounds, known as dolmens, stone circles, and the world famous alignments of Karnak. À Karnak, il y a euh, trois importants alignements de menhirs. Euh, donc, c'est un site qui s'étend sur euh, plus de 3 km. Il y a euh, près de 2500 menhirs, et donc des menhirs qui ne sont pas, euh, qui, se, qui se groupent en ligne. Emmanuel Vigier est curateur du Musée Karnak Préhistorique. Museum. Des menhirs, on en trouve partout dans le monde, euh, sur la façade atlantique, mais aussi euh, en Turquie, au Proche-Orient, en Indonésie, euh, en Afrique. Enfin, C'est vraiment un phénomène euh, mondial, finalement, euh, universel. Euh, mais ce qui est vraiment euh, le propre de la région, c'est la densité de sites mégalithiques. Parce qu'il y a les trois grands alignements de Karnak, mais il y a aussi, euh, rien que sur la commune de Karnak, 220 sites archéologiques, autant à Quiberon et sur les, les communes alentour. Donc c'est vraiment cette concentration exceptionnelle qui fait euh, la spécificité de notre région. But to find out more about these ancient civilizations, archaeologists here are turning their attention to the coastlines. Donc il y a 7000 ans au début du néolithique en Bretagne, on estime que le niveau de la mer était euh, environ euh, 8 mètres plus bas qu'à l'époque actuelle. Et on en a la preuve puisqu'on a retrouvé des objets archéologiques et des sites, notamment en baie de Quiberon, euh, à 500 mètres de, de la ligne de rivage actuelle. And there is clear evidence here that what was once dry land is now the ocean floor. It is called Air Lenique, home to this mysterious set of two stone circles, one still standing on dry land and one submerged beneath the sea. Donc, le site d'Erlanique est composé de deux hémicycles de menhirs. Un est sur la terre ferme, sur un petit îlot dans le golfe du Morbihan, mais l'autre est complètement submergé. Et donc, il y a euh, une enceinte en forme de fer à cheval d'une trentaine de blocs qui est actuellement sous l'eau, euh, dans le golfe du Morbihan. Et euh, notamment pour cette enceinte qui est submergée, on sait que les blocs... Euh, Sont, ne sont pas en granit, mais dans une matière qu'on appelle l'orthognes et qui vient d'environ 10 km d'Erlanik. These stones are silent witnesses to the ancient culture that erected them. And they are the beginning of a trail of clues. Clues to our civilization, to the secrets of the ancients. And it is a trail that leads straight into the sea. Archaeologists have already discovered evidence of Neolithic culture on this shoreline. Euh, deux touristes, et notamment un touriste anglais, a découvert en baie de Quiberon, là, à côté de Karnak, euh, quatre lames de hache polie en jadéitite, une roche très précieuse à l'époque néolithique. Et donc pendant un an, la découverte est restée confidentielle de façon à ce que les chercheurs puissent mener des investigations sur la terre, euh, sur la plage en l'occurrence, et sous la mer. Et cette découverte a été révélée au public le 20 septembre 2008. Les haches sont depuis euh, voilà, quelques temps maintenant présentées au musée de Karnak et visibles à tous. And that's just the beginning. Not far from where the axes were unearthed. Researchers have suspected an incredible set of underwater stone alignments, like the ones at Karnak. That extend out into the sea. En fait, de, 
Depuis 5-6 ans, il y a beaucoup de, de recherches menées euh, de, dans les fonds marins. Et donc il y a un site euh, en particulier qui s'appelle Kerbouniek, euh, où on a un véritable carnac sous-marin. C'est une dizaine de lignes de menhir sur 400 mètres de long, euh, voilà, qui est sous l'eau actuellement, qui est accessible juste quelques jours de l'année au moment des grandes marées. Et ce site a été étudié par un chercheur du CNRS, Serge Cassen. Euh, voilà. Et il se trouve euh, tout près finalement du lieu de découverte de ces quatre haches en Jadéi. Throughout history, the seas have risen to swallow the land. Scientists say it's not just our history, it's our future. And the proof can be found here in the Lamont Doherty Core Sample Lab. Jerry McManus has a library of more than 40,000 core samples. Long, narrow tubes of mud collected from far beneath the ocean floor. Going back in time, millions of years. Well, the Earth is busy transporting those, as those parts of the Earth that are above sea level to below sea level. So the continents weather, the sediments run in rivers and through the wind down to the bottom of the seafloor, and they accumulate there. And that accumulation stores the story of the environment that, that was in place at the time that those sediments were carried or produced It's essentially um, a museum or a tape recorder of the Earth's history that is sitting in place. And it's a tape recording not in English or in any language that we may be comfortable with. It's one that we have to scratch our head and try to understand the, the hieroglyphics. But it's a rich language and it's one that can tell us a great deal of information about conditions in the past. By studying the color of the sediment and microscopic debris within it, scientists are discovering the nitty-gritty details of the ocean's history. We can read the sea level from some of these deep sea sediment cores, and the sea level has gone up and down on the order of more than 100 meters, or more than 300 feet, uh, repeatedly over the last several million years. We know that vast ice sheets came and went on the surface of the Earth over the past few million years. And we've more recently discovered that the Earth's climate changed dramatically and abruptly in ways that are not currently fully understood. People are always drawn to live close to the water um, because it's a good way to trade and bring goods in on ships. It's a very good way to harvest the fruits of the sea is to live close to the sea so people have always been drawn sea level has been changing and will change in the future and people have adapted these changes have in the past been subtle and really the question is it, you know how fast could change really happen the context the geological context is that over the last million years let's say it has almost never been warmer than the earth is today It's really hard for people living in the center of our continents to think that sea level rise matters for them at all. It's a lot easier for people living in Louisiana or even in Manhattan, where they're surrounded by water. We've seen the results of natural disaster in the ancient ruins of Port Royal, Alexandria, Egypt, and coastal England. But today, changing climates and rising temperatures could be even more devastating. In the face of global warming and rising sea levels, could some of today's cities share a dangerous fate? Few cities are more closely associated with water than Venice, and few people live in closer quarters with the rising sea than the Venetians. Centuries ago, city founders settled on a series of 118 islands in a marshy lagoon on the Adriatic Sea. It's been a battle between the sea and the city ever since. Raphael Bras is a professor at MIT, working here with Venetian officials to save this historic coastal city. The Lagoon of Venice, as we know it today, is pretty much an engineered environment, an environment that was engineered by the Venetians. As such, in an environment as this one, it is expected that it will flood with some frequency, and it has always flooded with some frequency. 
the frequency of flooding, though, over all those years have increased enormously. Venice has been gradually sinking back into the lagoon that it was built on, and the Adriatic tidewaters entering the lagoon through its three inlets, the Lido, the Chioggia, and the Malamaco, have been rising. In the last century, flooding has steadily increased. Over the last 100 years, the relative sea level of the city of Venice and the lagoon in general has changed by 23 centimeters. Those 23 centimeters is a combination of sinking of the city and sea level rise. Through it all, Venetians have dealt with it in a number of ways. Temporary walkways are set up during the exceptionally high tides known as aqua alta. Some prefer to roll up their pant legs and make the best of it. But by the middle of the 20th century, the floodwaters were growing higher and higher. Venice was in crisis. But why was the city sinking? In the end, the answer was simple. They started looking at the problem, concluded that it was a combination of uh, issues of sea level rise and sinking of the city because of subsidence. Some of that subsidence was traced to groundwater pumping. Uh, the industries need water, fresh water, and that water comes from the ground. As you pump water from the ground, it affects the whole region, and many of the clays and soils underlying the lagoon, underlying the city, consolidate the city and the surrounding area sinks. That groundwater pumping was stopped in the 1970s. The remaining problem is issues of sea level rise and storminess. Today, the floods are getting worse and causing more damage. In December 2008, a potentially deadly storm surge flooded 95% of the city. If something isn't done quickly, Venice will be lost. Bross is designing a series of enormous underwater floodgates. It's the biggest engineering project in Venice's history. Like sleeping giants, they will rise from the ocean floor to protect the city when the sea swells, then sink back to the bottom when the threat subsides. The $6 billion project could be a model for other coastal cities living in the shadow of future floods. If sea level rise continues around the world, as it is expected, all coastal cities of the world will be seeing sea level rise and the danger of flooding. But if it reaches some of the levels that some people fear, then many parts of the world are in serious trouble. In fact, at that point, places like Cape Cod, New York, whole countries like Bangladesh will be in serious danger of ceasing to exist. Uh, Venice will be in the unique position of having started to deal with that problem earlier. So in fact, in my opinion, uh, the gates are absolutely needed. Uh, we need to do it now to protect the city, otherwise it will disappear. It's happened before. Dunwich, England, once the capital of medieval East Anglia. It was a prosperous seaport, bustling with thousands of people. Today, it's just a few dozen houses on a lonely coastal road. The rest of Dunwich swept into the sea. The most unbelievable thing standing here is the fact that out here would have been a large medieval city perhaps the fourth largest in the country in the 14th century. And so you're talking about at least a square mile with at least 12 medieval monastic or church structures. And that is now just so in evident uh, underneath this, this sort of fairly foreboding, turbulent, dark sea lies the remains of a, a great medieval city. What happened? In a series of deadly storms, Dunwich was ripped from its foundations and dragged away by the fury of the sea. What you've got a picture is a very stormy night. In fact, it was actually um, New Year's Eve. And uh, you've got this big, strong wind blowing in from the north, northeast. 
and the waves are basically being driven onto this beach. And what's happening is that as the tide rises and the wind and the waves sort of uh, encroach up the beach, they begin to cut away at the foot of the cliff. This cliff is made out of sands and gravels and has no sort of inherent strength. As a result, in one big storm, they lost a quarter of the city. 400 houses, at least three churches went in in that one event. Can you imagine the effect that must have had on the population? Their confidence would have been shaken. I mean, the, the church structures themselves, something that was protected by God, went in. They looked a little bit like that. They were, they were somewhat larger. Professor David Sear is a scientist at England's Southampton University. He's heard the story of Dunwich his entire life. Now he's searching for the last remains of this sunken city. D Dunwich is a place captured my imagination when I was um, a very young child. Um, and it did it because I was brought here at the time where there were the ruins of the last of the great churches, All Saints Church, were still exposed on the beach. So I could climb on these ruins. And my, my father, who was a clergyman, a, 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 a vicar, would tell me of the story of Dunwich while sitting on these ruins on the beach. So it was very, very tangible. It was very real to me. What's left of the city of Dunwich swept away nearly 700 years ago? Seer is working to confirm the stories his father told him using the latest underwater technology. What secrets lay submerged in these murky waters? David Seer is searching for any remnant of Dunwich, once a bustling center of medieval East Anglia. He's used high-tech sonic imaging to produce a picture of the ocean floor. Now we know the location of two of those churches uh, for definite, and we've been able to image using the multi-beam and uh, side scan sonar the actual distribution of those ruins, and they're quite discreet. So we know they survive, which means that out underneath the main part of the medieval city that lies um, between half a mile and a mile out, then there must be the remains of those earlier churches. But the technology can only tell Seer so much. To confirm his findings, he needs to go deep into the frigid, murky waters of the North Sea. Seer has put together a team of expert divers to dive down to Dunwich, whatever's left of it. They're heading to the spot Seer believes is the ruins of St. Peter's Church. An underwater metal detector will serve to locate any remnants buried beneath centuries of silt. Underwater high-definition cameras will record the dive. But as the divers enter the water, it becomes clear. After 700 years, the sea has still not settled, churning away full of liquefied land, making a visual search impossible. They'll need to rely on the metal detector and their sense of touch to discover the remnants of the church mired in the muck on the bottom. The underwater cameras are useless in these conditions. Seer won't know what the divers find if anything, until they return to the surface. <laughs> then one of the divers surfaces a few feet from the boat. Wow. Using a small metal detector and his own hands, he's located an unidentified object. Could it be an invaluable artifact from the days when Dunwich was dry? 
Little do they know that X-ray analysis will later prove this is no artifact at all. It's a bomb from World War I, one of millions dumped off the coast of England over the last hundred years. Not an artifact from Dunwich, but just one example of the obstacles Seer faces searching for a city sunken for seven centuries. It will take dozens of expeditions to develop a clear picture of what Dunwich looked like. By carefully chronicling what the divers find and cross-referencing it with the images produced by sonar, Seer hopes to create a complete map of the sunken city. It's great to be able to bring it all together and to be able to tell the story of, of Dunwich, this lost city, or as some have called it, Britain's Atlantis. If I'm honest, I would really like to be able to discover the medieval church structures, get their locations, work out the geography, if you like, of the medieval city. We, we say it was a mile square, that's a guess. Where were those churches? Where was St John's? We know now from our work that these structures survive and they survive in a way that are detectable. The problem now is that they're underneath sand so we've got to get a new technology in that will enable us to penetrate through the sand and visualize the structures that are there. But ultimately, wouldn't it be great to be able to say, yeah, we know where that medieval city was. Could the cities of today become the Dunwich of tomorrow? David Sear sees a potentially bleak future in Dunwich's sunken ruins. Many people ask, what, what, what is the lesson that you can take away from, from a, a site such as Dunwich and, and some of the other lost cities uh, around the world? When you live on the coast, you live close to a very powerful force, albeit tsunami or storm-driven or indeed earthquake-driven. Uh, and what happens, of course, is we learn that nature has these very large events that are quite capable of destroying large sections of coastal settlement in very, very quick time. And I think we have a challenge, particularly on, on, on many of the coastlines where we don't have really expensive infrastructure, but we have perhaps small communities. The cost of protecting those is really very, very high relative perhaps to the value of the land and the community when you look at it nationally. Of course, to the people that live there, it's a huge challenge to them and, and their way of life. But I think we're going to have to see more innovative ways of, of, of moving people back from retreating coastlines as the coastline erosion, of course, increases with global climate change and sea level rise. So I think we're at that point in time when we're going to have to really reevaluate how we manage our coastlines and some places, I think, are going to have to go the way of Dunwich. New Orleans, Louisiana. Renowned for music and culture, it's one of the most famous cities in the world. As North America's gateway to the Gulf of Mexico, it's one of the busiest ports in the world. But much of the city sits below sea level. New Orleans is like a bowl in between Lake Pontchartrain and the Mississippi River. Whenever it rains, water must be quickly pumped out. Pumps in the lowest part of town send rainwater into canals that cross the city and drain into the lake. August 29th, 2005, Hurricane Katrina slams into the Louisiana coastline. A mammoth low pressure zone, along with 120 mile per hour winds, conspire to create a killer storm surge nearly 20 feet high. And the canals, designed to keep the city dry, couldn't handle the overflow. The aging patchwork of levees and flood walls protecting the parishes didn't stand a chance. It failed catastrophically. The city was swamped. More than 1,000 people died. Thousands more were left homeless. New Orleans will never be the same. When the storm came, you know, it, it, it just broke. It, just, it was breached. It moved homes from off of their foundation, set them in the street. Some of them are still, as you can see right here, to where it is. It took cars and just flipped them. 
my name is Malik. My last name is Raheem, and I'm the co-founder of Common Ground Collective. Years later, city officials are still scrambling to rebuild before the next flood. You have people here that still got to pay their mortgage, even though they don't have a house. And they got to live. So you got people that's got to pay their pre-Katrina bills, their post-Katrina bills, and then they're out here trying to repair their homes. And they're literally working themselves to death. These are the people who built New Orleans. Many of New Orleans' poorest people were hardest hit. And they were faced with a tough choice. Stay and rebuild, or accept compensation, pack their bags, and move inland. As my ancestors was up in here as slaves building this area. And now for someone to tell me I don't even have a right to live here, an area where my ancestors toiled all their lives, you know, you could tell me that you're going to give me a few thousand dollars and I can move on? Oh, no, uh-uh, uh-uh, I'm going to be here. But for those who chose to stay, there are no guarantees. We can't conquer nature. I don't care what we do, we can't conquer it. We got to learn to live with it. And uh, building a living system, I mean, how high are we going to build it? So if we done built it as high, look how much higher we done built this one than that one there. You notice this is, is, is maybe at the same height with me. You know, now look at it. Then what are we going to do? We're going to build another one 10 feet higher? Until pretty soon that's all you have is big old levees? I mean, what's going to happen when it fails? You know, I mean, uh, what's going to stop the water from inundating this area again? we got to come up with some better solutions. So do we stay or do we go? It's a question that's been asked the hard way in New Orleans and Dunwich. One time, the, the, the concept of perhaps retreating from cities as large as New Orleans, Galveston more recently, um, would not have been entertained. But I think as, as we learn about the increasing frequency of, say, hurricane-driven um, coastal events or, or storm-driven coastal events, we are going to have to reassess this. And actually, the history of places like Dunwich are ones of resilient communities. The community is still here, but actually having to adaptively manage our progress back from the cliff line, back from the coastline. And it may be that in the future, we've got to have to think about that for larger settlements that have been built in, frankly, difficult and dangerous areas. The fate of coastal cities around the world is yet to be determined. Will the threat of ocean level rise and natural disaster become real? If so, Venice and New Orleans will be just the beginning of a destructive trend. Sunken cities are the stuff of legend and reality. Stories of mythical Atlantis overshadow the fact that many cities really have been lost beneath the waves. From Port Royal, Jamaica to Alexandria, Egypt, and more than a dozen cities along the British coastline. As the global temperature climbs and sea levels rise, could today's greatest cities share their fate? London, England. Once the seat of the world's most powerful empire, controlling one quarter of the world's population, but no match for the power of water. Storm surges formed by low pressure in the North Sea pushes water toward the coastline. The surge intensifies, becoming a killer tide by the time it reaches the Thames. A deadly surge in the 1950s drowned hundreds of people. In response, the city built one of the largest flood control systems ever devised. Massive floodgates constructed to keep the sea at bay. Spanning the Thames, the barrier lies just east of the heart of the city, and its famous bridges, government buildings, and tourist attractions that draw millions to the city every year. Rising waters here could be catastrophic. Today, Londoners feel safe, but this flood barrier of the past may not be enough to keep the super surges of the future from flooding the city. 
In one American city, the next disaster is already overdue. San Francisco, California. Even from the surface, you can see the problem. Here in the Bay Area, we're in the middle of the boundary between the Pacific Plate, which is going to the northwest, and the North American Plate, which is sliding to the southeast. And it's the slippage of these faults that causes the shaking and produces earthquakes. This is the Hayward Fault going between my legs. 25% of all of the motion between North America and the Pacific Plate is passing directly beneath me. When we see the fault at the surface, this is the tip of a crack that starts at about 10 kilometers, 11 kilometers below the Earth's surface. So we can trace the fault on the ground. It comes into this building. And if you look along the edge of the building, you can see the way it's bowed out to the right. The fault continues. It cuts the corner of these buildings immediately in front of us. And I think if you look at the junction between these two buildings, you can see that the fault, which goes directly below us, has been physically pulling the buildings apart. It's the same sense of movement we see everywhere along the Hayward Fault. The next earthquake on this fault is likely to be somewhere around a magnitude 7. And there are two types of damage that occurs. One is actual damage along the fault. And this is confined to a relatively narrow zone because the fault is very narrow. And then there's the shaking, and the shaking is felt over a much broader area. The Hayward Fault has sat silent for nearly 150 years, but seismologists say it's due for a massive and deadly quake, causing as much as a trillion dollars in damage. The Hayward Fault basically bisects the Bay Area and really goes through the most heavily developed, most heavily urbanized, industrialized section of the region. So when this thing moves, it's going to be a disaster. And that's just one of multiple seismic faults crisscrossing underneath the San Francisco area. The city on the bay is a sitting duck. A persistent legend says someday a colossal quake will cleave California from the continent, sinking the state. Scientists say it's a far-fetched theory. But in our own times, we know it can happen. December 26, 2004. Deep beneath the Indian Ocean, an unimaginably powerful earthquake, 9.0 on the Richter scale, releases the energy equivalent of 23,000 atomic bombs. This seabed buckles, setting in motion a catastrophic chain of events. A series of giant waves, some as high as 50 feet, slam into Thailand, Indonesia, India, and Africa. It's the deadliest tsunami in recent history with over 200,000 people dead or missing. Entire villages disappear from the coastline. And it doesn't stop here. Recent scientific studies suggest cities up to 30 feet above sea level are at risk of deadly flooding, storm surges, and hurricanes. This includes more than two thirds of the world's largest cities. Tokyo, New York, Mumbai, Shanghai, Jakarta, and Dhaka, Bangladesh. In total, 634 million people. It's a frightening vision of the future, 